Book two of Les Miserables opens with a 50 page deep dive into the Battle of Waterloo. And it's considered one of these like inexplicable Hugo digressions, these like flights of historical fancy that he just sort of like obsesses over and seem to some readers to sort of be a real um, sort of diversion or distraction from the plot of the book, which of course is a very exciting plot. And there's no question that book two is filled with some of the most exciting action uh, you can find anywhere. Uh, you have the book starts after the 50 pages or, or so of Waterloo with Jean Valjean escaping from prison, um, a daring escape as he uh, saves the life of a man on the ship uh, who's like dangling from the ropes. Um, and then he jumps into the sea. It's like something straight out of a spy movie. And he goes and he manages to rescue Cosette from her tormentors, the Thenardiers. And uh, there's this description of Cosette forcing, being forced to get water in the woods in the night. And she's so terrified. And the description of her childhood fear is so intense. And then in the middle of the night, while she's carrying this bucket that's heavier than her and she's struggling and she's cold, a hand reaches down in the middle of the night and helps her carry the bucket. And of course, it's Jean Valjean who's come to rescue her. And the plot continues. They make daring escape after daring escape. The specter of Javert sort of hangs over this whole part of the story. Um, there's one amazing moment where Jean Valjean is, you know, giving money to a poor person at night in the side of the street. And as that poor person looks up and lighted by the lamp, he sees suddenly the face of Javert, you know, and this again, this, this haunting that Jean Valjean is dealing with. But to return to the Battle of Waterloo, I think to understand why Hugo is so obsessed with this battle um, just requires a little bit of historical context. Maybe just to give a sense of some dates in the most um, high level bird's eye view where we stand historically speaking. So again, Les Miserables is published in 1861. Victor Hugo's living in exile. It's about the June Rebellion of 1832, 30 years earlier. And the June Rebellion was a rebellion against Louis Philippe I, a monarch, and in a way, the ideological political heir of these, this reign of monarchs that France has had ever since the Middle Ages, which takes you up from the 1500s all the way to the French Revolution of 1789. And what we see is from 1789, which is only 72 years uh, from before Les Mis was published, only about 43 years before this June Rebellion. So we're talking very small period of time. Um, this French Revolution marks this emergence of a revolutionary spirit in France, which is going to constantly reappear, constantly um, poke its head, fitful start in the direction of democracy, in this direction of increased liberalism, increased freedoms, increased rights for man, and things like that. And so this French Revolution is a period of about 10 years, which is marked by a kind of chaos. There was, you know, the reign of terror. There was the execution of Louis XVI. There was a lot of beheadings, um, a lot of anarchy, a lot of lawlessness. Um, and this finally ended in 1799 when Napoleon declared himself emperor. He, you know, claims power and he represents this kind of intermediate state where he is very much an embodiment of the spirit of the revolution, of the French Revolution. He is an anti-clerical figure. He's a figure who politically is against the monarch, but of course at the same time he is uh, an autocrat. Shortly after Napoleon becomes emperor, just four years after that, we get the Napoleonic Wars, where Napoleon goes on a campaign to conquer Europe. And he does a great job of it, conquering all sorts of surrounding territory. And it represents a real high point in this uh, sense of French prestige, of French political power, political might. His conquests last for about 11 or 12 years. In 1814, we have the War of the Sixth Coalition, where Napoleon is defeated for the first time. And we have the Bourbon Restoration, which is a restoration of the old monarch. And again, we have these two threads, these two political historical threads, these two groups of people in France. One is represents the monarchical political system, which has, uh, which is the ancient pa uh, power structure, which France has had since the Middle Ages. And the other is the spirit of revolution, the spirit of Napoleon, the spirit of uh, liberalizing democratic forces. An amazing thing happens after the War of the Sixth Coalition. Napoleon is exiled to this island of Elba, and he's there for a little bit less than a year, but he manages to escape. And in 1815, he arrives in Paris, and the king sends his army to 
go uh, detain Napoleon. And as the army arrives to meet him, Napoleon says, uh, soldiers, are you going to kill your emperor? And the soldiers uh, give him a cheer and they join Napoleon. So now all of a sudden Napoleon has an army and Napoleon is back, back from exile, back from the dead in a way. And this culminates in June 1815, the Battle of Waterloo. And in the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon is defeated a second time. And uh, then he's exiled to St. Helena. There's a Treaty of Paris and a return again of the French monarchy. This French monarchy is punctuated by revolutions. There's the French Revolution of 1830. And then there's the June Rebellion of 1832, which is the subject of our book. And so this is all just to give a very shallow sense of the kind of tumult, the kind of trauma and division that is cutting through French society at this time. And this is a political division that hangs over the entire book. To give a sense of how visceral and strong and violent these divisions are. In book three, we meet this character who is the grandfather of Marius. Marius, of course, plays a very central role in the book. He ends up falling in love with Cosette. Uh, Marius's grandfather has not allowed Marius to meet his own father, which is obviously uh, to us and within the world of the book, of course, an act of really real cruelty to his grandson and to his son. His son is not allowed to meet his grandson, meaning uh, the grandfather's son is not allowed to meet his own son. And the reason the grandfather hates his son so much is because his son was a general in Napoleon's army. And this, you know, political division cuts through his family and the, you know, there's unspeakable animosity. There's an incredible tirade uh, from Marius's grandfather, Giel Guillen Normand. Guillen Normand. I'm going to mispronounce a lot of names uh, in this book, unfortunately. At this point in the book, Guillen Normand is fuming over the fact that his grandson Marius has become a Republican, meaning his grandson Marius is no longer loyal to the monarchy. He found out about his father, that his father was a general in Napoleon's army, and he now believes in those ideals of revolution, those ideals of freedom, those ideals of, of universal human rights. And this is his grandfather's reaction to that. Quote, why did you leave my house to go and become a Republican? Bah, in the first place, the people want nothing to do with your republic. They want none of it. They've got common sense. They know very well there have always been kings and there always will be. They know that after all, the people are all only the people. They don't give two hoots for your republic. Do you understand, you idiot? It's quite dreadful, this willfulness, becoming infatuated with Pierre Duchesne making eyes at the guillotine, singing serenades, and playing the guitar under the balcony of 93. The balcony of 93. 93 is 1793, which is the reign of terror, which is this period of chaos. And so the grandfather, Guillaume Normand, is saying, you're romanticizing this chaos. You're romanticizing this period of, of beheadings and, and executions. He continues, they're such fools, all these young fellows. They deserve to be horsewhipped. That goes for all of them without a single exception. Breathing the air in the street is enough to drive you mad. The 19th century is poison. Take any young pipsqueak. He grows a goatee beard, thinks he's a real somebody, and turns his back on his elderly relatives. End quote. Victor Hugo plants the seeds of this political division, of this strife that cuts through French society at this time, even earlier in the book. In book one, when we are getting to know the character of Muriel, we learn about a trip he makes. He makes a trip to visit a man, his name was G, and he lived in the countryside near D, and he lived all by himself. And we learned that this man was part of the convention, which means he was part of that provisional government, which took power during the French Revolution, after the French Revolution. And so now, now that we're living under monarchy in monarchical France, he's a real enemy of the state. He's a real enemy of the king. Uh, he's considered dangerous. He's considered an outcast. And even though he's shunned by society, uh, the, our bishop, Muriel, makes a point to visit him. And they have a discussion. So, reading from uh, book one now, quote, In the countryside near D lived the man all by himself. This man was, let us straight away utter the dread word, a former member of the convention. His name was G. In the little world of D, member of the convention G was spoken of with a kind of horror. A member of the convention, can you imagine? This man was almost a monster. He was all but a regicide. He had done terrible things. Skipping a bit, 
Besides, he was an atheist like all the rest of those people, end quote. And so this is the person that the Bishop Muriel sets out to visit and talk to as he's at, towards the end of his life. And so in conversation with the bishop, D says, quote, I voted for the end of the tyrant, that is to say, the end of prostitution for women, the end of slavery for men, the end of benightedness for children. In voting for the republic, that's what I voted for, right? He's, he's defending his vote. He's defending his position as a revolutionary. He's saying, why was I a revolutionary? Why was I against the monarchy? It's for these reasons, you know? He says, quote, I voted for fraternity reconciliation, a new dawn. I assisted in the overthrow of prejudice and error. The collapse of prejudice and error creates light. We brought down the old world and the old world, that vessel of misery in being overturned on the human race has become an urn of joy. The bishop interjects, not unmixed joy, says the bishop, right? Meaning it's more complicated than that. The, our, our character D continues, you could say clouded joy. And now after that disastrous return of the past called 1814, right? 1814 is Waterloo after the defeat of Napoleon, after the return of the monarchy to France, he says, vanish joy. He continues, alas, the work wasn't finished. I admit we destroyed the old order in its deeds. We were not able entirely to abolish it in its thoughts. To put an end to abuses is not enough. Attitudes must change. The bishop interjects, you've brought about destruction. Destruction can be useful, but I distrust destruction compounded with anger. End quote. And that's the bishop's um, criticism. He says, it was a violent, angry rebellion. I don't trust you, the bishop says to this character, G. And G responds, quote, justice has its anger, monsieur. And the anger of justice is an element of progress. In any case, in whatever anyone may say, the French Revolution is the greatest step forward taken by the human race since the advent of Christ. Unfinished, maybe, but sublime. It has worked out all the unknowns in the social equation. It has tempered minds, calmed, appeased, enlightened. It has sent tides of civilization sweeping across the earth. It has been a good thing. The French Revolution is the consecration of humanity. The bishop could not refrain from murmuring, oh yes, and 1793, 1793 is the reign of terror. The member of the convention strained up in his chair with almost lugubrious solemnity. And insofar as a dying man is capable of crying out, he cried out, ah, there you are, 1793. I was expecting to hear that. A cloud gathered for 1500 years. At the end of 15 centuries, it burst. And you put that thunderbolt on trial, end quote. He describes the reign of terror as this thunderbolt bursting out, this, this pressure which is finally released, the pressure built up over years of monarchy and oppression. And that's the debate. And this is the tension that cuts through our entire book. It's the same tension that boils over into the June Revolution, which is sort of the centerpiece, the plot piece upon which the entire book hinges. And as we saw from this monologue of G, he says, 1814 was a disaster. 1814 was the calamity. 1814, the, the defeat of Napoleon, was the end of this dream of freedom. And that is what Waterloo stands for. This political, historical, national catastrophe. Victor Hugo takes us to Waterloo. He looks out at the battlefield and he asks us to see what he sees, to see that field of battle and understand its significance, understand what it means today, today being in the 1830s France. He talks about the different interpretations and understandings that people have of this battle, and his point is that no one understands it. He writes, quote, The battle of Waterloo is an enigma. It is as obscure to those who won it as it is to those who lost it. For Napoleon, it was panic. Blucher sees only gunfire. Wellington cannot make sense of it. Look at the reports. The accounts are confused. The commentaries are muddled. And he goes on to talk about different historians, what different historians of his time say about the Battle of Waterloo. And Hugo sums them up. All the other historians are to some extent blinded, and their blindness leaves them groping in the dark. And it's Hugo's audacity and his poetic power he wants to fill this void. He wants to give us the authoritative understanding, the clear-eyed understanding of Waterloo. What was Waterloo? Hugo tells the story of Waterloo in great detail, and he goes through what happened, the events that led to Napoleon's defeat. And what Hugo describes is a series of unlikely little random events that sort of come together, play off each other in a 
chaotic, spontaneous, surprising way and result in catastrophe, result in Napoleon's defeat. It's this early, early vision of like chaos theory. It's the sense that a butterfly flapping its wings in one place has an effect somewhere else. Little miscommunications, little choices, decisions here and there have these huge effects. And the point that Hugo is drawing out that from God's perspective, every little event is consequential. After walking through the battle, after walking through these events that led to Napoleon's defeat, Hugo writes, quote, What we admire above all in a conjecture such as that of Waterloo is the amazing ingenuity of chance. The entire disaster is wonderfully orchestrated. This is Hugo standing at the field of Waterloo and asking us to look. Quote, the field of Waterloo today has a peacefulness that belongs to the earth, man's impassive pedestal, and it looks like every other plane. Yet at night, a kind of visionary mist arises from it. And if some traveler wanders there, if he looks, if he listens, if he dreams like Virgil before the fateful plains of Philippi, the haunting catastrophe grips him. That ghastly 18th of June comes to life again. The spurious monument hill disappears. The undistinguished lion vanishes. The battlefield regains its reality. Lines of infantry ripple over the plain. Galloping charges sweep across the horizon. The terror-stricken dreamer sees the flash of sabers, the glint of bayonets, the flare of bombshells, the monstrous exchange of thunderous fire. He hears, like a dying rasp from deep in the grave, the indistinct clamor of the phantom battle. Those shadows are grenadiers. Those glistenings are cuirassiers. This skeleton is Napoleon. That skeleton is Wellington. All this is no more. And still they clash and the fighting goes on. And the guiles turn red. And the trees tremble. And there is fury even in the clouds. And all those untamed heights, Hugomont, Mount Saint-Jean, Frischmont, skipping, appear in the gloom indistinctly crowned with tumults of specters slaughtering each other. End quote. So how does Hugo make sense of this? What judgment does he cast? How does he invite us to assimilate this historical catastrophe? He continues, quote, This madness, this terror, this collapse into ruin of the greatest bravery that has ever amazed history, was this without cause? No. The shadow of an enormous right hand falls on Waterloo. It was the day of destiny. The power that exceeds man shaped that day. Hence, the terrified furrow on those brows. Hence, all those noble souls surrendering their swords. Those who had conquered Europe were completely cast down, having nothing more to say or do, sensing a terrible presence in that shadow. On that day, the prospects of the human race changed. Waterloo is the pivot of the 19th century. The demise of the great man was essential to the advent of the great century. Someone who is not to be challenged took care of it. The hero's panic is understandable. The Battle of Waterloo was not just a matter of cloud, it was a matter of meteorology. God has passed by." End quote. And this is an example of something I see Hugo doing a lot in this book, which is holding these events, holding these catastrophes, taking the trauma and recasting it through the eye of history as something which belongs to God, something that was orchestrated by the universe. Um, and from that perspective, from that perspective of distance, from that God's eye view, there's a sense of its own rightness, the sense of it had to be this way, that this was paving the ground for something better. There's this incredible, beautiful description of the de defeated Napoleon at the end of Waterloo, a groping Napoleon finding his way to uh, the generals to surrender, basically. Quote, at nightfall in a meadow near Genap, Bernard and Bertrand stopped a man, grabbing hold of him by the skirt of his coat. Distraught, bemused, this desperado caught up in the rout and carried along this far, had just dismounted, tucked the reins of his horse under his arm, and wild-eyed was making his way back alone to Waterloo. It was Napoleon, still trying to keep going. Immense somnambulist of this shattered dream." End quote. Hugo goes on to talk about how this defeat of Napoleon has left a hole in Europe today, has 
cast a shadow over Europe. He says, quote, defeat increased the stature of the vanquished. Bonaparte overthrown seemed greater than Napoleon standing. Those who had triumphed were scared. His folded arms became a disquiet of monarchs. Alexander called him my insomnia. This fear stemmed from how much of the revolutionary there was in him. The specter caused the old world to tremble. Kings reigned uneasily with the rock of St. Helena on the horizon. This is what Waterloo was. But what does it matter to the infinite? All this storm, all this cloud, this war, then this peace, all this shadow did not for an instant dim the gleam of that immense eye in which an aphid hopping from one blade of grass to another is equal to the eagle flying from belfry to belfry between the towers of Notre Dame.